everyone that's joined so far, we'll just give everybody one more minute um, just to join, just to make sure the numbers stabilise on everybody joining, and then we'll begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Academic Health Science Network's Northeast and North Cumbria's Digital Innovation in Primary Care Showcase event. Before we start, I'll just go through some general housekeeping. Can all attendees please ensure that your mic and cameras are turned off during the session to help with the quality of the call? Of course, please feel free to turn cameras on during any of the Q&A sessions. If you feel like you need to take a break from the session at any time, do feel free to drop out and rejoin if you can. If you need to access the captions function, there are three dots on your toolbar. Click and select turn on live captioning. Just to make sure everyone is aware that we will be recording this event and from that photographs may be taken. We're actively encouraging questions during the event. Please pop them in the chat box and we will try to answer some of the questions during the event, but we will allow for any unanswered questions to be answered after. If you struggle to access the chat facility, please email your questions to our lovely Leanne at leanne.maitland at hsn-nenc.org.uk. We will also put that in the chat as well. The presentations and the recording of the event will be circulated to all attendees following the event. Next slide, please, Anna. So that is just the run through of the agenda. We've got some great speakers planned for you guys. Um, this the speakers have been picked to match the audience so that we can demonstrate to everybody how our innovation pathway can look from start from initial concept of idea all the way through to adoption spread. Next slide, please, Emma. So welcome everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Emma Richardson and I'm an innovation program manager for the Academic Health Science Network Northeastern North Cumbria. My role is to help innovators from the primary care workforce create, develop and roll out their innovations or ideas. This is the second of a series of four showcase events across the next year. We hope to introduce you all to the world of digital innovation and hopefully inspire some projects of your own. Our first speaker is our own Dave Belshaw. He is our Digital Transformation Director and will introduce the Academic Health Science Network programme of work, the Digital Pioneers. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Emma, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I know I've got, I'm down for 15 minutes um, on the agenda. I don't think I'll take that uh, time, but I, but I might. I would like to start just with a, a little bit of an explanation. To the, the, the purpose of this event was initially was a, a Northeast and North Cumbria focused workshop to uh, showcase some of the work that we've, that we've been doing in our, uh, on our pathway. And I'm aware that since that time, it's actually opened up quite significantly. We've got a number of national colleagues on the call as well. So welcome to all. But what that means is this workshop might be a little bit of a hybrid of um, showing you how we've tried to set up uh, our innovation support across primary care in the Northeast, whilst also advertising some very local initiatives and local opportunities. So please bear with us. There is a mix of information um, uh, on this call. Uh, next slide, please. Just thought I'd start off with a little bit of an explanation about the Academic Health Science Network. There may be people on the call who don't know. So the Academic Health Science Network, that's up, us up right at the top for the North East North Cumbria, but we're joined by uh, colleagues from 14 separate Academic Health Science Networks across the whole of England. Uh, and we uh, provide uh, innovation support and spread and adoption support across a number of different pr uh, uh, programmes. So we we, we have three main commissions, one from NHS England, which covers spread and adoption of, of national programmes such as uh, Inclisiran uh, uh, and maternity support and, and, and maternity products. We've also got a patient safety collaborative, which is commissioned from NHS uh, uh, Innovation. 
and we we um, uh, provide uh, patient safety programs again across uh, across all those areas you can see there. And then thirdly, we have a commission from the Office for Life Sciences, which is predominantly focused on economic growth and innovation. And that's perhaps where we differ most from other uh, NHS focused development organisations. So we very much try and sit in that middle ground between industry and innovation and health and social care. So I often try and use the, the quite a basic example of uh, an innovator from a different angle. So if I'm an innovator in the NHS, so I'm a, a doctor or a nurse or an administrator or a practice manager, and I have an idea for an innovation, a widget that's going to save the world, for example, I'm not necessarily going to have the knowledge of how do I get a prototype widget built? How do I connect and engage with industry? How do I protect my idea? So the Academic Health Science Network is there to provide that support to NHS innovators to help guide them and through and navigate that process. And I've got a slide in a few slides time which just highlights some of those areas. So we're there to do that. Similarly, if you're working in an SME uh, in, in a part of Newcastle and you've got a, an idea for a widget that's going to save the world, but you've got no idea how to collect, connect with local uh, clinicians in order to test out whether it's a good idea or not, how to get your prototype tested in a clinical environment, how to get that evaluation done with academic colleagues. You're, you have an industry background, you won't necessarily have that knowledge. Once again, the AHSN can sit in the middle of that and support you with that agenda in order to get those real world evaluations uh, done, get you access into the right clinical support networks and, and also clinical challenge areas in order to support your innovation uh, or not as the case may be. So that's where the AHSN sits. We, we sit in that middle ground, but predominantly we're here to support innovation uh, in, the health and, in health and social care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have had in the North East and North Cumbria a digital programme for just over a year now, coming up to 18 months. Uh, and it really came about um, during the early stages of the, of the pandemic. Uh, where we recognised a real acceleration of the spread of digital solutions. Um, a lot of us uh, went to work from home. Uh, a lot of face-to-face -face appointments with health uh, clinicians uh, were, were then switched to online consultations. And actually, we recognised the need to support that, uh, that rapid change but also how do we continue to support innovation and, and create innovation at a time of rapid change? Digital technology is changing the way that we deliver health and, and care services very, very significantly, perhaps more so now than in the last, uh, in, over the last two years than in the 20 years prior to that, uh, I would say. Because of that, it also leads to some real challenges in the system. And we have a significant proportion of people in the North East and North Cumbria and nationally who are currently excluded from that digital innovation and from those digital services. Um, those groups are also more likely to be socially disadvantaged and, and actually experience the health inequality issues uh, at the same time. So there were some real drivers there for us 18 months, two years ago, to really start to uh, work into this space and look at how we support innovation and how we support the system uh, from a digital perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So we have over the last 18 months or so looked for opportunities to support digital innovators and we're going to talk through, you're going to get some of those examples as we go through the next hour and a half. We also want to understand and try to um, uh, figure out what future clinical digital needs are. Uh, there are lots and lots of innovations coming uh, over the hill, everything contactless monitoring um, uh, through to the use of XR, uh, and artificial intelligence in, in health and care provision. And we really need to understand what the clinical drivers are for that and where that sits. We've, we've tried in the past to have a tech driven approach. So we've got a solution and we've tried to drive it in the clinical settings and that doesn't always work. It always works much better if there's an identified clinical need and then we find the tech or the digital solution to fix that need. We also want to think about how we identify solutions and deliver them at scale. So there are real boundaries and always have been. I've worked in the NHS for 30 years now and there's always barriers to spread and adoption. Whatever we invent in, in one ward 
won't work in the ward, even just up the corridor, because it's different and we do things slightly differently here. So we need to, to figure out how we do things at, at scale better. One of the ways that we can do that is working with industry and academic colleagues to find those innovative solutions. And the other thing that we've really focused on over the last year or so is identifying and working on plugging some of the knowledge and support gaps. For us in the Northeast, that's particularly been around artificial intelligence and RPA, robotic process automation, and also around the whole emerging world of um, uh, NICE uh, fr uh, frameworks and DTAC, digital technology assessment criteria. Um, so that really has emerged as an area of, of need for us across the Northeast and North Cumbrian. How do we support our innovators to meet those regulatory um, needs and, and, and frameworks? Next slide, please. So as part of that conversation, we, we had a real focus on, and, and one thing that the pandemic that really did for us was it drove us a lot closer to our primary care colleagues than we ever had been. And we forged relationships with um, GPs and uh, CCG digital leaders that we'd never had opportunities before. And, and that really opened a door for us to have some conversation with our regional NHS England colleagues around how do we really ramp up the um, relationship between the Academic Health Science Network and our primary care system? And we came up with this concept of supporting a digital pioneers program. And that's what we're going to, you're going to hear about some of the elements of that this afternoon. There are three broad columns that support that digital pioneers approach. The first one is the innovation pathway, which I'll touch on in a second. But the important bit is to, um, that actually what we agreed with our local NHS England digital first primary care colleagues is that we would actually allocate uh, a funding resource to support digital innovation in primary care. So we have a fund uh, that is a top slice of the digital first primary care money. And we've been supported with that through our what, what were CCG digital colleagues uh, to allow us to do many things um, to do that. Uh, and we are now openly encouraging people with innovations to come forward for resources and for funding to help support the development of that innovation alongside the intellectual and knowledge support that we can that we can give them. So that's one thing that we've done. It's been a huge success. It's taken us a little while to get that off the ground. We are now starting to see innovators and innovations come through that funding process. Uh, and we think over the course of the next 12 months or so that will provide some significant support to innovation in digital innovation in primary care. The second column is around digital champions. We also recognise that we were asking people to um, promote and support new digital practices without necessarily having the skills and the knowledge base to, to do that. So do people have the right knowledge around IP, e intellectual property, even to know where to look for help or what it actually, what IP actually stands for? Have we people got a basic knowledge of, um, of the digital technology assessment criteria? Have people got a place where they can go and get support from peers and work through and talk through digital innovations and the, and the barriers and enablers that exist. We we didn't feel that that opportunity existed, so we've created a digital champions program, which we've commissioned from a provider, and we are now on our third cohort. And I think people will probably correct me on this, but we've got somewhere between around about forty digital champions who are going through that process, being ha having peer support, and that peer support is predominantly coming through a community of practice. So we've set up communities of practice to support those digital innovators via digital champions, but also anyone else who comes forward with the digital innovation, peer support, helping to explore uh, 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 what it will take to deliver uh, their idea and their innovation. So those are the three main pillars of that. That's a combination of funding from Digital First Primary Care and our NHS England colleagues and investment from the Academic Health Science Network in order to, with a real focus on primary care. Uh, next slide, please. So this is quite a busy slide, but we wanted to just give you an overview of this is the approach we take internally as an AHSN. And the very top of that um, slide shows you the three broad areas that we that we think about innovation. So we think about innovation in terms of discovery and helping to uncover and discover what those innovations are. We think about innovation in terms of development. 
how we then take that initial idea and we help it develop and we test it and we get the evidence base of whether it works or not. A lot of our colleagues in industry will tell us that they would much rather we told them at that stage that their idea is not going to work than encourage them and allow them to continue to invest their money and their time in something that ultimately does not have a market or will not be um, or will not be adopted uh, by clinicians for whatever reason. And we've got many examples of innovations that uh, we, where industry colleagues and SME colleagues will come forward and say, I've got this great idea, this, this widget's going to save millions of hours of NHS time. And actually we say, actually, no, it won't because of this reason. Uh, and they would much rather be told that early doors. We then have the later phases of innovation support, which is around deployment, which is around brokering investment, uh, around scaling up and thinking about spread and adoption. And we've got a number of programme lead colleagues who specialise in those uh, spread and adoption um, processes. We've got some examples as we go through uh, of various stages of this process. Um, but when we then get into the hexagons below, which get into much more uh, detail. So we work on everything from uh, market analysis, identifying unmet needs, helping that innovator and their local team develop their value proposition. So what is that innovation actually going to do? What value is it going to add? Have we thought about that? Where are we going to get that evidence from? How are we going to collect that evidence? And we work a lot with colleagues in that area. Real world evaluations, deploying that innovation in a real setting, in a ward, in a clinic, in a primary care practice, within a PCN, and actually really testing out is this going to work or not? Does this give us the benefits that we think it's going to do that? Does it create any financial savings? All the way through then to thinking about uh, business case development and commercialisation. We, we work with a lot of colleagues in the NHS around um, thinking around, well, you've got this idea, it's a great idea. Do you want to commercialise it? Do you want to think about using this innovation to generate income? Uh, and if you want to do that, how do we safeguard that? How do you work that in partnership? Perhaps if you've got an SME colleague uh, or, a, or a digital app developer who's worked alongside you to develop the innovation and the product, how do you then make sure there's a fair and equi equitable split of that commercial product? How do you then go on to sell that commercial product? So we have a, quite a number of those conversations within the HSN as well. So as you can see from that slide, into, there, there is a, um, an interactive version of this imminent where you'll be able to hover over the hexagons and actually get further information on uh, what we mean by PPR or what we mean by prototype and all, what we mean by national spread. Um, so you'll just have to watch this space for that. It isn't quite ready yet. But from, it, from an internal academic health science network point of view, this gives you an idea of the breadth of support that we can give to innovators. So again, if you're a, a colleague working in an NHS or a social care setting with an idea for a widget that's going to save the world, please come and talk to us and we have a whole range of support and access to funding available um, if it's the right idea, uh, which is the first big uh, um, tick box. Uh, I, I, I'm, and we're here, we are here to help. There are going to be some uh, contact details up uh, later in the, in, the, um, in the slideshow. Next slide, please. So the next steps, and this is the local and national uh, separation that I talked about earlier. Um, if you're in the northeast and North Cumbria region, please get signed up to become a digital champion. It's a great program. Uh, we, we commission a national provider to, to do that. We're thinking about certification in the future, um, but uh, at the moment it's a great place to come and think about how you're supporting uh, digital uh, and digital pathways and digital innovation and digital improvement within your primary care setting. Again, only if you're in the North East and North Cumbria, otherwise we won't have enough space. We have a series of, I think there's six different lunch and learn sessions we're going to be running between now and March. We're going to be running well, one a month. Um, the first one is on market research and that's on the 13th of October. That, that will be followed by lunch and learn sessions on um, uh, real world evaluation, patient public involvement, the innovation pathway, regulatory approval, and um, IP uh, is the other one, intellectual property. Um, so please, if you're interested in those uh, lunch and learn sessions, please uh, contact us afterwards and sign up. This is the second of our showcase events. Uh, the thing that 
my NHS England regional colleagues will tell me off for not mentioning is that, that, that actually when we talk about primary care, we talk about primary care across all of the primary care areas. So we think about pharmacy, general practice, dentistry and optometry. So the first uh, showcase event that we had focused on pharmacy, and that was three months ago. This is the second showcase event where we're focusing on general practice, and we have two more planned for the year. Uh, the next one, I think, is dentistry, and the one after that is optometry. Uh, but that could be the other way around. So again, please contact us if you're interested in those, or um, you have colleagues who may be interested in those. Uh, keep an eye out for them. And the th the the second to last bullet point. Uh, I guess is, a, is to everyone on the call is that there's no idea too big or too small. The other thing that we're going to be doing is setting up some um, drop in uh, opportunities so that you can come and have some just some conversations with us. Share your ideas with us in a safe space. Uh, there's no silly ideas. Uh, there's no idea too big or too small. We're happy to have that conversation with you. The final bullet point again, this is only if you're from the northeast and North Cumbria, otherwise we'll be inundated. Uh, if you do have an idea and you want to talk about that, um, there's Emma's email address uh, who was on at the beginning. Please come and talk to us. If you just want to have a general conversation about our approach, how we've managed to set this up, what the background relationships and investment looks like from digital first primary care and from an academic health science network point of view. If you're interested in replicating this innovation, um, this innovation hub approach, I know we've got colleagues on the call today who are going to be presenting from Yorkshire and Humber, which is our neighbouring academic health science network, who are also on this journey. If you're from another region or a geographical place in England and you want to talk to us about that, again, please come and talk to us. We're happy to share our experiences, happy to share with you our contacts in NHS England. If you're looking to secure a similar process or similar investment, we're happy to share that with you. I think that's me done. I hope that wasn't 15 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to hand you back over to Emma now. Thanks very much for your time. It's a great agenda this afternoon. We've got some fascinating presentations uh, and I hope you really enjoy it. Thanks for, thanks for coming. That's great. Thanks very much, Dave. And you were just about in time. So next we have a great video from GP and clinical lead for Digital First Primary Care, Dr. Gareth Coakley. He's going to introduce the Digital Pioneers work from his perspective and discuss why he thinks digitally upskilling the workforce and patients is important for primary care and how digital innovation plays a part in this. So I'm really passionate about digital because I think it it offers so much potential to everybody and that's from from staff to patients to to the allied system. It, it's a massive enabler it's not, not going to fix all the problems in the NHS in every world, but enables people to, to make contact with services easier, it enables flow of information, it enables people to, to look after their own health better with things like informational apps, for example, so they can look after their own health and be empowered as patients. D digital can also break down barriers. Patients may not want to come and tell their pharmacist or their, their GP about something, but they'll put in an email or an online consultation. So it breaks down those barriers and some of that embarrassment, um, which is a big problem in, in particularly UK general practice and quite often why particularly cancer is often diagnosed late. So if you can break down barriers and get those contacts earlier, it makes a massive difference. So digital can, can fix nothing, but enable everything. The Pioneers is about getting staff involved being, and pioneering the digital journeys. Um, because they're the experts. I'm not the expert of how the practice works in Sunderland. The practice manager there or the receptionist there, any member of staff there is. They know, they know their practice population, they know their staff, they know the local geography. And if we can get them engaged to fix local problems and think about local innovations, then actually they can pioneer it locally and then we can see if that applies elsewhere. And if it doesn't apply elsewhere, brilliant, it's still fixed that problem in that one practice. But almost certainly, it can be adapted to other things. It's having the enthusiasm to get involved and to, in many ways, ask the stupid question. Because generally, they're not stupid questions. We just think they're stupid questions and we sit there and don't ask. But actually, asking the daft question, asking the, well, why are we doing it that way? Anyone that wanting to improve digital inclusion, you know, if, if they can sit there at home and think, you know what, my grand who's 90 couldn't do this, get involved and tell us so we can 
figure out how we can get your grand to 90 to do it because being 90 shouldn't exclude you. And actually having that expert knowledge of it being your grand makes you an expert in that situation. And it's those experts we need. The Digitify Nerve programmes for anyone involved in primary care, whether that's general practice, pharmacy, dentistry, optometry, and from anyone, any age of their career, any just starting out, just coming up to nearing retirement, anyone that can offer experience and, and new thoughts. So I guess what we're asking is for people to get involved and want to get involved, and there's so many ways they can do that. They can engage with the Innovation Hub if they've had an idea of a way to improve a service and, and the Innovation Hub will support them through that process. Um, there's CPD and training that, that's on offer. There's a wealth of knowledge out there and a lot of it sometimes, particularly in primary care, people feel siloed and are just on their own in the practice and we want to be able to connect up practices. So reach out, whether it's help you need, whether it's help you want to offer, whether it's help with innovation, whether it's training you need reach out and let us connect you with someone. So just before introducing our next presenter, Leanne is going to put a survey link in the chat function. So this is a brand new thing that we're trying now. It's a survey that's going to is hoping to identify any digital challenges that are currently faced by you in the primary care. So we are going to share another survey link later in the event, which will ask about your digital successes in primary care. So we hope to try and do a matchmaking event of any challenges with successes, and then we will introduce you via email after the event. So we will ask for your consent that we can use your email contact details as well. And um, like I say, this is a test run for us. And if it's a success, we will share that in emails after the event. It's my pleasure to introduce Beth Walland from Westwood Medical Center, who will be sharing with us her amazing idea that she hopes to be funded through the Digital Pioneers program. Beth's idea sits at the very beginning of what we call the innovation pathway. And she knew that she could reach out to the HSN for support as she is one of our digital champions. Over to you, Beth. Thanks, Emma. Um... Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Emma, for inviting me along today. I'm a bit nervous, so please bear with me. Um, so, a bit background, I am the Digital Training Care Coordinator for West Road Medical Centre, which is GP surgery in West Ends of Newcastle. I joined the practice initially as digital champion, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and over time my role has evolved, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit uh, more about that in a second. Just some background on, on how I got involved with uh, the Academic Health and Science Network. I saw the Digital Champion uh, program advertised on one of our bulletins and I thought, hmm, good idea. So I signed up for it and it has been fantastic. The the members of the group that I was in, we were all at very different stages. Some were, were just starting out, some were quite advanced, but it gave us the opportunity to discuss um, sort of day-to-day -day issues that we get in the surgery, um, share ideas, things that we may not have thought of, what works, what doesn't work, how we can improve. Um, so, you know, I, I cannot rate it highly enough. It's been fantastic. As part of that, I was talking about some of the, the ideas that, that I've had. And one of my um, real passions is learning disabilities and serious mental illness. As I said, my, my role has evolved a bit. So I now look after the people on the learning disabilities register and the um, serious mental illness register. <clears throat> We've always had quite good uptake on annual health checks, but we wanted to to make it better for for want of a better word for for the patient a, a better experience, so that they can they can maximise the time that they have with the clinician. Annual health checks are massively important. You know, we can pick up things that um, you know issues with medication, issues with with uh, and things that that people wouldn't necessarily speak to the, their GP about. 
So massively, massively important. So it used to be that we would send out a letter, as most GPs do, send out a letter saying your annual health check um, is due. Please call the surgery, make an appointment to come in. If you have a learning disability, a serious mental illness, or even something like anxiety, picking up the phone to make an appointment isn't easy. It can be confusing, it can be daunting. We spoke to the experts, and by that I don't mean sort of, you know, the, the, the big wigs. We spoke to the people um, that mattered. We spoke to the patients and said, how can we help? So we've totally revamped our system, and I'm just going to run through a very brief presentation with you, if I can. So I'll just do the usual, can everyone see that? That's great, thanks. Sam. So let's say we revamped the system completely. So rather than sending a letter out to the patient, the patient now gets a phone call in their birthday month where I will book them in for their appointment, for their annual health check. They get extended time. It's not your, your bog standard 10, 20 minutes. They also, after their annual health check, get booked in to see a social prescriber just to see, is there anything else we can help with? What more can we do? That way, the onus isn't on the patient who, as I said before, can find it very, very daunting. It gives me the opportunity to introduce myself as their care coordinator. So they've got one point of contact with the surgery. It helps us to build relationships, build trust between the surgery, the carers and the patients. And that reduces inequality in itself. It gives us a better understanding of what our patients' needs are. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it helps to reduce patient anxiety. Once we've booked them in for the appointment, we send a, um, an info pack, which has a confirmation letter, which is written in across between um, easy read text and standard. Some people with learning disabilities aren't as severe as others, so we have to be very careful that, that everyone is included in that. It has both text and visuals. So for example, it will have a picture of a clock with the time of their appointment in it and a, a little picture of a calendar with the date of their appointment in it so that if they have issues with reading, um, they can see as a picture when the, their appointment is. And also a picture of who they're seeing, which in, um, helps to with, if, um, sorry, can't speak, which helps to familiarise the patient with their clinician. It gives a brief summary of what the annual health check is and a, a, an explanation. It's got some pictures on it. You know, this is a blood pressure monitor. This is what your blood pressure is. This is a heart monitor. This is what it monitors. This is why it monitors, etc. It has a health information um, pack for the patient to take with them so they can fill in there um, any other illnesses or related illnesses that they have, their medication, lots of information that they can take to other appointments so that the patient isn't spending the first 10 minutes of an appointment going through, here's my medication, here's what other illnesses I have, here's what issues I have, etc. And it gives them the opportunity as well to fill in any additional info that would be helpful. So how best to communicate with them and what their additional needs are. And I have to say it's been working really, really well. We are seeing patients who have never come in for annual health checks before. It's not enough for us. What more can we do? So we again spoke to people and had a think. And we know that visualisation familiarisation and experience are really, really valuable tools if you have a serious mental illness or a learning disability. So this is what we came up with and here's where I get really excited. <clears throat> so as part of the annual health check, what we can do is a walkthrough. And usually when I say this to people, I, I get that look of confusion because there are hundreds of walkthroughs out there. 
if you go on YouTube, Vimeo, NHS health sites, loads and loads of walkthroughs. It's going to be different. It's going to be interactive. The patient will go through the whole annual health check in an interactive way from start to finish. It's going to be personalised, so it's going to be based on our surgery, meaning that the patient can familiarise themselves with the building, the surrounding area, the staff and the whole process. So they'll start outside the building, they can pan around and have a look at you know, what's nearby. They can go into reception and they can choose to speak to our virtual receptionist and sign themselves in or they can use our uh, self-service sign-in screen. All the avatars will be based on our actual staff so that when the patient actually comes into the surgery, they can you know, look at the staff and go, oh, yeah, you're so-and-so, I saw you on the video. They'll be able to interact and tap on various parts of the screen. For example, the um, self-service sign-in, they'll be able to tap on it. How does this work? What happens if I press that button? How do I sign myself in? What does this do? They can then choose to take a seat in the waiting room or they can explore it. So what we're hoping is that the TV screens in the waiting room and the notice boards will actually have live notices on them. That if the patient finds any groups, events, notices, be able to tap on that and save it. <clears throat> the virtual nurse will call them in and they'll take part in the health check. Before the health check starts, they'll have the opportunity to explore the surgery. So again, they'll be able to, to have a look around the surgery and tap on um, various things, you know, heart monitors, stethoscopes. What does this do? Why am I doing this? Um, they'll get a description of what it is, why we use it, what it's needed for, does it hurt? That's one of the questions that I kept coming up with. Um, and that way the, the anxiety is lessened, they know what to expect. They'll be able to get that information in, um, in text format as subtitles or um, or as a voiceover or a combination of both, whatever suits the patient best. If they've got any questions that aren't answered on the walkthrough, they can make notes and save them at the end of the walkthrough. It's going to be available in several languages. As we said before, the patient will have the ability to, to take notes all the way through. And if the not answer can be sent through to the clinician beforehand. So again, we're maximizing that time because the clinician will have those answers ready for them. The patient can go through it at their own pace and they can do it as many times as necessary to make them comfortable. It means we're maximizing that appointment time so the patient um, can, can ask the important questions. This can be adapted for other procedures, other services, you know, other health checks. We can use it as a training tool for new clinicians. We can make it as part of an app. We can make it into an app. And this is my dream, the virtual reality um, idea. So it could be, you know, in the future, patients will have the ability to put on a virtual reality headset and, and go through the walkthrough. But that's for the future, first things first. The only limitations are our imagination. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, um, I might not be able to answer them because we are at the very, very early stages. I have to say that Emma and her team have been incredible. They've been so encouraging. They have, um, one thing I love is that they are as passionate as myself um, about this. <clears throat> They've offered all sorts of additional support, things that I 
have no experience in, they can guide me, such as intellectual property. Um, you know, I, I had no idea about that whatsoever. I just did an idea that I thought could help a patient. So I'd just like to say thank you to, to Emma and her team for this. Um, and thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Beth. And thank you for, for all your positive comments there. It's an absolute pleasure to work with yourself because you're so passionate about what you do. And like we say, we're very excited about the potential that this idea has. Um, so thank you very much, Beth. Our next speaker is Helen Hoyland, and she's from the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. And she's very kindly agreed to share with us all the results from their recent Horizon Scan activity of digital technology, technology available to primary care. Over to you, please, Helen. Thank you. So I'm just going to try and share my slides. So bear with me one second. And while they're um, coming up, can I just quickly say to Beth that that was absolutely amazing and really inspiring stuff and it's so inclusive. So I wish you all the luck with that. It, it really is amazing. So bear with me while I just pull these up. So hi everyone. So I'm um, Head of Commercial Digital and Growth at Yorkshire and Humber HSN. Um, like Dave said at the beginning, we're sort of earlier on in our journey, but we've got two digital primary care innovation hubs now set up with two of our three integrated care systems across Yorkshire and Humber. So um, the, the objectives and the ethos are very similar to what we're discussing today in the context of North East North Cumbria. Um, and we're at the stage at the moment where we're really reaching out to general practice, uh, pharmacists and the whole of primary care to understand what some of the unmet needs and challenges are and where there may be some gaps. So um, I wanted just to give you a quick um, headline of the resource that we've produced to help us do that. I'm not going to show you all of the content of what we've um, created today, but if you'd like to have a look at the resource, um, it's for everybody to share. So um, come and find us or reach out to our colleagues at NENC and we'll gladly share that uh, with you. So what we've done in the first instance is we've created a digital primary care horizon scan, as we've called it. Um, so it features innovations which are cross reference with the priority themes in primary care and all of the innovations have been sourced from um, through a structured methodology, primarily from all the pipeline. So each of the 15 HSNs across the country has a pipeline of innovation and we share all of those in a central repository and we're able to do some very detailed searches around specific innovations and specific themes. Um, so there's lots of really interesting innovations in there across a broad range of uh, topics. Um, as Dave mentioned again earlier, there's lots of information in there about some of these um, transformational technologies such as robotic process automation and artificial intelligence and triaging and looking at things right the way through the, uh, the sort of the primary care or general practice uh, pathway. So um, it doesn't include every innovation out there by any means, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a start. Um, and so this is available now. So it, it helps really just in terms of where should I start to look? Um, I might have a problem over here. Or we, we've got a clinical need here or a gap here or a digital challenge here. Is there anything out there at the moment that could help us with that, that we could either um, adapt or just buy it off the shelf straight away? So it, it helps you sort of address some of those high level questions. Um, so we've done this in the context working with two of our integrated care systems, as I say, um, very much grounded in all of the latest sort of policy and, and um, things like the fuller report. So it's very sort of contextual and we've divided it up into um, nine key themes. So you can see those there. So uh, workforce is obviously huge, uh, demand management, automation, pharmacy, uh, general practice, care at home, diagnostics. Uh, point of care testing and anything to do with EPR or anything that the, some of the big um, GP systems might be doing in terms of innovation. So all of this is collated into a, a rather large slide pack, which we're absolutely happy to share with you all. Um, so all AHSNs are sort of really active in the horizon scanning space, and that's sort of the language that we talk in. But what it means basically is it's a systematic, systematic gathering of intelligence for early detection of technology. And innovation and trends and so we do we do lots of these over the course of a year so if you were to come and ask your AHSN or, or um, come and have a chat with us or with with NENC or with with your local AHSN we can pull these sorts of things together for you generally speaking and it just helps to identify relevant and proven innovation 
It helps you to do planning uh, and make informed decisions, evidence-based decisions around planning and commissioning and spend, etc. So we define the scope and the focus, and then we'll consult, we'll look at a business intelligence repository, we'll do some desk research, and then we'll uh, produce one of these in, in a time frame. So as Dave mentioned again early on, we do this by looking at the different stages of the, uh, the pipeline, the discover, develop and deploy. So the innovations that we uh, talk about will be at different stages of maturity and readiness, and we sort of theme it along those lines. So you know, is it adoption ready? Is it on a framework? Can we procure it easily? Is it more early stage and perhaps there's additional research to do? Um, all of those sorts of things are addressed. So I'm not going to go into the whole methodology there, but um, this just describes quickly how, how we go about the process. And we can talk about that if you want to reach out to us afterwards. And then the output is basically um, a nice big slide pack, which summarises each of the innovations against those nine core themes. And then it, it overlays with the stage of the innovation. So all of this is now available and we're more than happy to share. So um, please do reach out to us. Um, and that was it for me, just a quick headline about what we've been doing. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, if anybody has any questions for Helen, if you would like to, to raise your hands. Alexander, I don't know if that's a historical hand or if you had a question for Helen. That was uh, historical, sorry. Sorry, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Helen. See if there's any questions in the chat. And sorry, Helen. Can I, uh, it's just a, it's a question. How long did that kind of um, rise and scan take, do you think, from start to finish? And what support did you get from, I might have missed, you might have said this at the beginning, I might not have heard it. What support did you get from primary care colleagues in kind of setting out those key areas for investigation? So we had a bit of a steer from our sort of expert uh, reference group in one of our digital innovation hubs. So the first one to sort of go live. Um, so that included the ICS digital pr uh, program leads, uh, GPs, CIOs and others. So they gave us a bit of a steer around the main themes. Um, and then we went off and did the uh, desk work and the sort of the pipeline scan, Dave. So um, overall, it took quite a long time. It wasn't a sort of a full time job for somebody, but from um, start to finish, I'd say about five weeks or thereabouts to produce that across the team. And we did also reach out, it's worth saying, just very quickly to other HSNs as well. So other HSNs from across the country have contributed ideas and case studies for this consolidated um, report. Great. Thanks very much, Helen. And again, an amazing piece of work that we have just found absolutely invaluable over here at NENC. So thank you very much for sharing that with us and presenting it today. If anybody has any further questions to think of for Helen, if you either pop them in the chat or email them to myself or Leanne and we'll try and follow up on them after the event. So most of us know and appreciate the value of research when working on any project, but especially within innovation. Our next presenters, Professor Sarah Slight and Research Assistant Sarah Wilson, are going to give us an overview of the Eden Project and how research can be used to inform digital innovations. Over to the two Sarahs. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Emma. I hope you can see the slides. Let me just click on here. Um, and yes, it is a bit of a, a, a double act today. Myself, the two Sarahs um, are presenting. We're, we're, we're talking about um, a digital innovation that's um, national and we've got um, experts um, in many different areas. So we've got them in digital technology, in the data science and AI, and also in the neurodegeneration. So we've across, I think it's 48 different universities, research projects and companies um, across the world. And, and the aim of our project, the Eden Initiative, is to use digital technology to try and detect diseases um, that cause dementia before the symptoms um, appear. So here, just to be clear, um, an example of all the different partners that are involved, Newcastle University, obviously, and um, other um, contributors, 
um, across the country. So um, I suppose that where we, we, we started was we wanted to know, you know, are, are the public keen to know um, about this area? W would it be of interest? So the diseases that can, like Alzheimer's, that can potentially cause dementia um, potentially start in the brain um, up to two decades before the symptoms um, appear. And when we conducted work, um, uh, AR UK, um, Alzheimer's Research UK conducted work, it showed that about 87% would like to maybe take a test or a series of tests that would be able to tell them whether um, they might potentially be in the very early stages, um, especially maybe if you know they had a family member or they had um, other um, worries and concerns that you know this might be something that that would appear later on in life um so as it currently is um you know when you start to try and you know detect these early changes you would you know they might appear in the blood and spinal fluid um, before you start to see measurable changes and our our whole idea or initiative was to move away from the invasive and the expensive tests and try and think about clues in our everyday lives. So things like, you know, the way you walk, the way you navigate, you know, uh, you often hear stories about people getting lost in shopping centers, things like, you know, how you might use your phone. So how fast you might type a text or the way you swipe, etc. You know, could we, could we, you know, gather information on these different changes, subtle changes, and try and um, see a pattern or potential pattern emerging again before the symptoms um, would appear? And why is this information important? Well, I suppose it could give people an opportunity um, to make lifestyle choices that would potentially reduce their risk of developing dementia. Um, you could maybe triage people into clinical trials for future drugs that are ongoing. Um, there's also, you know, better understanding of the disease processes involved in the early stage disease and also, you know, uh, potentially giving you access to new, new treatments. So the vision of Eden, um, again, we were the, again, it's a very large team, but we were going to combine digital data and clinical data um, to try and develop a toolkit to, again, identify people who might potentially be at risk um, 10 to 15 years earlier um, than um, we, than they currently, uh, before they present symptoms. Um, so the Newcastle team um, is involved in lots of different areas, and I'm, again, conscious of time. We were only going to focus on one, but quickly, as an overview, um, we've conducted work with healthcare professionals, so primary care staff, um, secondary care staff, asking them, you know, what are the, the key considerations when you want to implement and, and use a digital technology uh, for early detection? We also wanted to do work with stakeholders like brain health clinics and ICSs, understanding again what are their needs, um, what would be, you know, essential to successful implementation and adoption of a, of a toolkit, and also thinking through maybe what, what challenges we might face and also how we might overcome those challenges. Um, we've done work with patient and public involvement groups. Again, really important to get the views of users of these tools and see how we can improve the design. Um, and then, as Dave mentioned earlier on, um, digital inequities is, is a big area. So, so basically, you know, there are, and we're aware of disadvantaged groups who, who will be unable to benefit from technology. It might be that, you know, lower income groups can't or do not have access to smartphones, or if you live in a rural area, you might not, the internet might be slower, or again, you know, migrants, their first language might not be English, and therefore they could have difficulties using 
um, such a tool. So that work is also ongoing um, at Newcastle. And then also evidence of benefits. So it's just basically showing a return on investment for um, such a tool. So I'm going to now um, hand over to Sarah, who, who did the work. Um, again, just focusing on one area, um, healthcare professional work, to talk some more about that. Thanks, Sarah. So we set out to look at what the perspectives from the healthcare professionals are on the approach that Eden's taken. So to do this, we asked them what the key considerations are when using and implementing digital technology for the early detection and dementia. And we recruited participants through various networks up and down the country, all related to the NHS. And from this, we've got 11 GPs and seven secondary care staff. So that included some memory care health nurses and a physician, a psychiatrist even, and a dementia specialist. And then in these interviews, we explored three key areas. The current dementia pathway in place and whether they think such a tool would be best uh, sit within that. The acceptance and opinions on early detection of dementia itself and the use of digital tech to aid this approach. And then what are the, the challenges that we might face when implementing this tool within the NHS? Next slide, please. So from these interviews, we identified three key categories of concern. So one was around the patients themselves. So who actually is the target group and how we're going to make sure that we're going to have enough resources to expand on that. And if we're going to target, say, people under the age of 65, where the symptoms, the, the neurological pathways might be starting to develop, how we're going to make sure that we're, we're putting enough resources to make it proportional to the, tech, the, the cases that we're picking up and we're not wasting a lot of resource. How we're going to make sure that we're not contributing towards health disparities that are currently in place and we're not going to create new ones. So for example, one clinician was saying that they don't currently have tests in secondary care to support those with learning disabilities. So they have severe dyslexia, they get passed on to a neurologist and that's a bit unfair because it's an extra step in the pathway for them. So we can't be doing stuff like that and we can't be like excluding people who are digitally excluded. It's like Sarah was saying before, if those who are living in a rural area and have like slow Wi-Fi connection, we we'll currently have a tool that's going to be dependent on Wi-Fi. And we all also need to be considerate about the impact of early detection itself. So how is this actually going to impact the everyday life of a person? So how is it going to affect their insurance policies? How is it going to affect their mental health? And we need to make sure we have support services in place to support that. Then the second group of um, concern is around health professionals themselves. So how's the tool going to affect the current clinical pathway? Who's going to governance it? So who's responsible for like setting up the participants with the, the tool itself? Who's going to monitor them? Who's going to support them when they have some technical issues and things like this? And then how is this going to affect the burden of the workload? The NHS is overwhelmed as it is, and if you're going to add an extra bit of workload on them, how are people actually going to feel about that? And also we need to see about the acceptance of the early detection of dementia itself amongst clinicians. Because a lot of people are coming back saying, well, what's the point in giving out an early detection of dementia if there's nothing we can do about it? Like it's all right giving them lifestyle changes that they might, could implement to reduce the risk. But those who have hypertension or high blood pressure who might be already at risk of developing dementia, they probably already get given that advice anyway for other health conditions. So we sort of need to give them something else extra as well. And there's also a bit of concern around the dissemination of the results. So healthcare professionals don't really want to give out a tool that just turns out a random number and they don't actually know how it drives that number. So we're going to use like a metric like sleep or anything like that. They want to know exactly what it is about that sleep pattern that makes someone at high risk. And then the third and last category of concern is around the digital tool itself. So how is it accurate compared to the tools that are currently in place? And how feasible would ASHA be in when it's implemented within the NHS. So although they did understand that it's not a detection tool, which is what they already have in place, it's a detection tool that'd be a bit earlier in the process. It sort of makes it easier to comprehend how it compares to existing tools. And we also need to have the technical appraisals in place. So things like put it in nice guidance and things to make clinicians feel they can trust in the tool a little bit better. Next slide, please. So from these key con categories were identified four key considerations that need to be taken into place when developing a digital tool that will be implemented within the NHS. 
So one is around having evidence of accuracy and having all the appraisals in place before embedding it within the NHS. And this will help clinicians feel they can trust in the tool and the output a bit better. We also need to consider the current clinical pathway and the impact on workload. So we're going to be implementing a tool within the NHS that isn't really appropriate for that setting. Clinicians are going to feel like it's a bit of a burden on the workload and less of a positive thing, but we'll put it in a position where they do have the workforce to manage that demand and they do have in it sort of like is influence within that workload to begin with. It kind of seems like a normal way of practice rather than a burden. We also need to provide training and support for both patients and staff so everyone understands what the tool's doing, they know what to expect from the tool and they can trust in the tool. We also need to have intervention options in place to improve the acceptance of early detection amongst clinicians and for patients to feel like they're, they're being heard. They're not just going to give this information that might place a bit of a burden on the, the mental health or insurance policies and there's nothing they can do about it. And we also need to be accessible to all within a target population. So as we saying before, we can't exclude people based on digital exclusion or like disabilities and things like that. We need to make sure that we're inclusive to everyone. Next slide, please. And from this, we're going to be doing a bit of work around digital inequities. So that's a bit of work that I'm doing with the PhD. So it's very early days at the moment because I just started in April, but I'm happy to come back and talk about a bit more people that are interested in that. And we've also got a colleague working around stakeholder engagement. And this is also early work at the, bit, the moment, but we're also looking out for any networks that might be suitable to reach out to, to for people that take part in interviews and things. So we're happy to keep in touch with people about that one. Next slide, please. And thank you all for listening and thank you for having us today. There's my emails at the bottom if you think of any questions you'd like to ask, but also feel free to, to ask them now as well. Oh, thanks to both you, Sarahs. If anybody has any questions, if, if you want to pop them in the chat or raise your hand, we've got a little bit of time if anyone has anything to ask. Um, the part of the role at the HSN, and I, I mean, it's a very small role that we're going to be helping with. And we're just going to make some introductions into our digital inclusion group that we have set up. Um, so, like I say, a, a very small part of the project, but we're happy to be working and being in contact with both Sarah Slight and Sarah Wilson on the project. It, it has been absolutely fascinating. Um, research has always been a little bit of my passion, so that's that's my favourite hexagon when it comes to the innovation pathway. So it looks like we don't have any questions, so if you do have any that come after the event, just pop us an email and we'll send them on. Thank you both. Before our final presenter, Leanne is going to post our second third survey in the chat, and that is just around any digital successes that you've had in primary care that you would like to share with colleagues around North East North Cumbria and possibly nationally, if that is OK. So our final speaker is our very own Associate Director, Jody Nichols. Jody is going to explain to us all the Clinical Digital Resource Collaborative as an it's an NHS owned digital innovation that has been rolled out. Over to you, Jodie. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Favourite part of the hexagon, of the favourite hexagon, I see. I love it. All right, let me just share my screen. Just let me know when you can see it. Yes, can see it. Yes, Thanks, brilliant. Thank you very much. So my name is Jodie. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come today and talk to you about CDRC. So I'm the associate director for, or one of the associate directors for the HSN up here in the, in the North East and North Cumbria. But I also support and spend a significant time, amount of my time supporting CDRC, which is um, an, a North East grown innovation in primary care. And CDRC stands for Clinical Digital Resource Collaborative. Um, and this, this is just to give you a, a flavour of what CDRC does and some of the resources that we develop. Um, and, and there's an innovation that's come out of the North East and North Cumbria. So what is CDRC? Um, as, as Emma alluded to, it's a, an NHS owned digital resource with nat um, national reach, it enables individuals and cl clinicians to deliver gold standard patient care. CDRC is a collaboration of experts across the region that work together to develop resources within clinical systems, EMIS and System 1, which are the main clinical systems that we utilise in the North East and North Cumbria. Why do we do it? Why are these clinicians come together? It's to support low cost improved patient care through these powerful clinical resources. We're creating dynamic templates and, and resources, contextual alerts, patient safety icons, 
as well as standardised regional referral information, allowing clinicians to streamline processes within primary care, improve patient outcomes and put patients and put sorry clinicians in control of patient care. It provides what CDI do, CDF, CDFC does in the background is it allows us to provide guides to the clinical teams to allow full navigation of the resources and also CDIC resources are centrally updated, which allows them to be safe and obviously they are safety reviewed as well. And I'll, I'll go into that process in a second. So our vision as a team is to improve population health, release clinical time within clinical teams and to deliver gold standard patient care efficiently through trusted NHS owned digital resources. So our mission, so we create resources right now in System 1 and EMIS, like I said, the main ones in uh, the North East and North Cumbria. And what we want to do is to prevent clinical teams across the country having to reinvent the wheel every time within their own clinical practice, creating um, their own resources, creating their own templates, their own searches, their own, uh, their own audits within their own clinical systems. We want to create them centrally so people can access them um, and, and we want to develop them so they're free at point of use and they're hazard reviewed. And therefore, they do exactly what they say on the team when they're hazard reviewed um, and they're created for clinicians by clinicians. It's a clinical led team. So this is part of the team. And I know Andrew at the bottom here is not a white dot. He is um, a real clinician. Unfortunately, he was quite shy and sharing his picture at the moment. But you can see our two lane founders, which is um, Dr. Forbes and Dr. Harness, are two uh, GPs in our region. But we do work very closely and are key partners with NEX, um, CBC Health, AHSN, um, and Primus in North Cumbria are key partners in CDRC. So what type of resources do we develop? Um, we develop intuitive templates and contains sort of contextual information. Um, we develop patient safety critical pop-ups and, and, and uh, patient safety icons, powerful searches and reports, which is one of the key ones that people are really keen and interested in and developing resources in, and then standardised regional referral letters into, into um, different care um, environments. So what, what are the benefits of using CDRC? Um, there's a number of benefits and we have done some, some research, um, external research has been evaluated, has come in to really like, sort of dig into this and understand some of the benefits of using these templates and resources that we've developed. Um, and one of the first things is it improves quality and patient safety for patients and clinicians in the NHS. And it does that by identifying patients who are undiagnosed, misdiagnosed or coded incorrectly. Um, it improves time and cost savings because the resources are, are pre-designed and pre-validated and, and they're, they're there to use within the system one in EMIS. This is not, it's not a plug-in, it's not external to these clinical systems, it's already in the systems themselves. It's flexible implementation so clinical teams can use the particular resources that they're interested in um, and not the others so that if they have a particular area that they want to focus on, a particular clinical area can just use those resources. It's safer compliant with data sharing. There is no data sharing. You use the resources within your own clinical practice itself and you pull through your own patients of which you will contact directly through your practice. So we are literally just developing the resources and you use them within your practice themselves. And we improve performance management so that the suite of resources can be used sort of real time to look at the, the many aspects of clinical performance. And therefore, with this through that clinical performance is an opportunity to increase your practice income. And obviously using that real time to help their, their cross performance off the back of that. So who's it for? Um, so we've developed this for a number of reasons. So there's healthcare professionals managing individuals, individual patients in practice and for healthcare professionals working in clinical leads within their organisations, looking after a particular cohort of patients or admin roles within the teams, looking at, so for example, long term condition management organise, um, uh, conditions. And obviously then if you zoom out a little bit from that, you've got PCN, CCG, federations for population based interventions to really help focus in on particular needs, for example, around health inequalities. So we do just a little bit into what our development process is. There is a development process in the background. and I won't, I won't linger on this slide very long, but because we do work across a number of different organisations and we all come together and we any requests for new resources are, are logged at a central point, which is a piece of software that we use. And um, these are all then brought to our fortnightly huddle, which we um, which all our clinical members come to where we prioritise work, look at bot bottlenecks, any any issues that have come up from, from our development. We liaise once there's been agreed in terms of a work plan, we liaise with key partners. 
to look at who's doing what if there's um and at what point and if there's already people working in that space for instance if we're working on something to do with cbd would uh, see would we'd see with any other organizations or works being developed there um in advance so therefore we're not we are not working in silo we're working with what's already there we work very closely with with next so once the resource is developed next do the hazard review next being um, for those who are not based in the northeast, it's a north of England care support unit, um, and we work very closely with them. They do the hazard review process, which in, which essentially enables us to validate those resources to make sure they're safe, and they pull through exactly the people who we're looking for. Um, once they've been validated through next, we then do the, the testing of the resources. It's usually in an, an expert area, so if it's, it's a resource or an auditing, for example, um, paediatric asthma, we'd ask some experts in that area to, to run that search within their practice to make sure that it's pulling through the individuals that we require. We develop the training materials of that and obviously they create the comms um, to make sure people are aware of what's going on. So in terms of key wider partners, um, as, as I have alluded to um, in this presentation, we obviously have key links with all the CG, regional CCGs, um, the CBC Health, um, Northern Cancer Alliance, Sundon GP Alliance, Primus Cumbria Next, and obviously the ICS as well as their, their farming. Um, and this is just, I've just put this slide in as, a, as an example of some of the national work that we've been doing on the um, FH work, which is a familial hypercholesteremia piece of work. And this is just taken from our website, uh, which is where all our resources are, the guides are, are housed. And the idea is that the website provides the clinicians when they click onto it, the information of what they need of what the search would pull through. So this talks about the Dutch lipid scores and the different types of um, parameters that are taken into account or not taken into account, depending on what search you, you pull through. And this is just an example of the FH one. There's many on, on the website. I just wanted to highlight um, the, the simplicity of which it's presented. Again, just as one of my last slides here, this is just an idea of some of the wider work that we're doing. Um, so the FH is just a, a small piece in a, in a much larger CBD puzzle. Um, and, and the different models that we're presenting forward right now is that we have our, our primary care community model, which is where our main cohort of work comes through. So working closely with our primary care networks to understand the need and drive. And that comes through with working on long term condition management, cancer to a great referral. We did a lot of work on COVID-19 and um, meds management. But we do have a like, bespoke upstream work and um, work which um, is the more what we'd like to term I have a dream. So it might be a clinician who or a team of individuals who have a particular who have seen a vision and, and um, have a particular need to um, identify a, a group of people that falls just outside of what the primary care would be would be normally looking at. And then you got if you look at the long term conditions, you can look a little bit closer into that the different long term conditions that we've developed, and also new update of resources um update resources underneath around the quaff and the, and the lesses and the deses and all the work that we've been doing around that. I know that was rather quick, but if anybody's got any questions, um, please feel free to, to, to ask. Hi, Jordi. I have one question from Janina. So is this just based for the North East and North Cumbria or are there any plans to roll it out wider? No, this is a, a thanks for your question. This is a, a national initiative. So so this can be accessed nationally. Anybody who has access, access to System 1 and EMIS can access these resources. Great, thanks very much, Jody. If there's any more questions, if you want to pop them in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, then that would be great. So incredibly, we have run ahead of time. So I'm going to put some of my wonderful colleagues on the spot. Oh, we've got another question in the chat for you, Jody. How can we access the resources? Put my camera back on. There we go. Um I didn't know who sent that. I didn't. I didn't see the name that come up. Um, if you go on our website, you'll be able to see all our resources on the website, and if and I'll put the website address into the the link. Um, or you can email me, and we can have a conversation about whatever resources you're looking for and what we have available. But the first part of call would be the. Uh, thank you, Emma. Would be the the website. Great. Thanks very much, Jody. So, like I said, I'm going to put some of my colleagues on the spot. I know there has been a lot of interest in the chat with our digital champions part of our programme. So I would like to open the floor to our lovely Rachel Forbester, who leads on the digital champions, and she can just give a very brief two minute overview of the programme that we run and how we host that. Thanks, Rachel. 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's been a really exciting afternoon. Some fantastic presenters. Hope you've enjoyed it. And I do see in the chat function that the Digital Champions Programme has generated lots of interest. Um, at the moment, we're commissioning that locally for the North East and North Cumbria. There was a national programme that is on um, hold at the moment, which you can see in the chat function. But a couple of people in your own regions have suggested getting together and talking about that. And we're more than happy to share our approach, how we've commissioned that as a service, what we hope to achieve in terms of our ambition and that approach. And it is a programme that runs for 12 months, so there is a level of commitment from somebody signing up to become one of our digital champions. Um, but as Beth mentioned in her presentation, is how fantastic an opportunity that's been for her. And it's not necessarily the, just the content, but it's the richness of people getting together as a community of practice to share their best practice to what challenges they come across. Um, and the, the, commissioner, the company that was commissioned are on the call today as well. Um, and you know they've been integral in delivering um, something that fits against our own ambitions in the North East and North Cumbria. And what we have also done is open that not just to general practice, but open it up to other primary care areas, including optometry, dentistry and pharmacy. Um, so we're really trying to make that change and equally share some best practice against those other disciplines as well. So anybody who is in North East and North Cumbria and is keen to sign up, then please email Leanne Maitland. We've popped that in the chat function um, or it will be available and we'll add that in again. Um, and equally, if it's other areas, we are more than happy to share our approach. So thank you very much, Emma. Great. Thanks very much for sharing that, Rachel. Does Would anybody else like to ask any questions to any of the speakers that we have had today? I know there was a few questions raised for Beth earlier on. All right, then, if there are no more questions, oh, we have a hand up. Robin, would you like to take the floor? Hi there. Yeah, I've got a question for Jodie, actually. Um, in our patch, um, We've got the Arden suite of searches is quite widely adopted. Um, is that something that's also the case in your area? And is this sort of added on top of the Arden's um, standardization? Jordi, are you happy to take that question? seem to have lost Geordie. Okay, sorry Robin, would you mind Not sending us via email and then we can I get back to you. Will do. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, oh, we have we got another hand up, Graham Earl. Give a quick brief response to, to Robin. We we do have a mixture across in North East and North Cumbria of some practices that do use Arden's. And we are looking at doing a piece of work to understand what the differences are between, you know, what CDRC can offer as well as what Arden's uh, provides practices as well uh, to understand if there is uh, differences within within the systems that benefit to, to having both or whether we could move across to, to using the CDRC and um, and not use Arden's, but the, there's still work ongoing with regards to that. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So I would just like to say thank you to everyone who has joined the event today. Um, I think we will wrap up a little bit early so people can get 10 minutes back in the diary and grab a cup of tea before the next meeting. We hope you found it both interesting and useful and we hope that it's inspired you to find out more or sparked an interest in developing your own digital innovation in primary care. If you're in North Eastern North Cumbria, please do reach out and get in touch with us and we will try and support you as best as we can on your journey. Thanks very much for joining everybody.